This lecture is intended for the Niklaus Children's Hospital Clinical Neurophysiology Fellows. The topic is electrical fields in neurophysiology. This talk will be conducted in three sections. The first section will be conducted in a conversational format. The second section will be conducted in a question and answer format. And at the end, I will make some closing remarks. Clinical neurophysiologists must have at least a rudimentary understanding of electrical fields. Electrical fields in the nervous system can be generated by great matter generators or by white matter generators. Gray matter generators can be subdivided into those arising from the cerebral and cerebellar cortices and those arising from nuclei in the brain brain stem or spinal cord. White matter generators can be subdivided into those originating from nerves in the peripheral nervous system and those originating from tracts in the central nervous system. Electrical fields have specific characteristics that allows them to be labeled as either open or closed, traveling or stationary, near or far, and brief or long. Electrical fields can be classified as open when they are detectable beyond the confines of the structure generating them. Open Electrical fields are found in cortices, nuclei, nerves, and tracts. Electrical fields can be classified as closed when they can only be detected within the structure generating them. They are only found in the great matter in the nuclei. Electrical fields are classified as traveling when they advance their position steadily in relation to time. Traveling electrical fields occur in nerves and tracts. And according to some authors, they may also arise from the brain. Electrical fields are classified as stationary when they do not change their position with time. Stationary electrical fields arise from cortices and nuclei. Electrical fields are defined as near using different parameters depending on whether they originate in the great matter or in the white matter. In the gray matter, a field is labeled as a near field if it is recorded using a derivation with closely placed probing and reference electrodes. In the gray matter, near electrical fields are generated by pyramidal shaped cells in the cortices and at other regions of the brain stem and the spinal cord. White matter near fields are those whose morphology, onset latency, and peak latency changes with changing recording conditions. They arise from nerves and tracts. Far electrical fields are also classified differently in the gray than in the white matter. 
in the great matter, far fields are defined as those captured using derivations with long inter-electrode distance between the probing and the reference electrodes, but they are not captured using derivation with closely placed electrodes. They arise from the cortices and from the nuclei. White matter far fields are those with constant morphology and peak latency regardless of the changes in recording conditions. They arise from nerves and tracts. The final parameter we use to label electrical fields is biological, in biological tissues regards their duration. The definition of brief and long varies among different authors. Electrical fields are defined by some authors as brief when they last less than 300 milliseconds. Brief electrical fields can occur in the gray matter and in the white matter. An electrical field is classified long by the same authors when they last longer than 300 milliseconds. Long electrical fields can be generated by cortices, nuclei, nerves, and tracts. I will at this time change the format of this talk from conversational to question and answers. The first question is, magnetic lines and current lines are the same thing, A true, B false. I'd like to start answering this question by, take, by talking to you about magnetism. Magnetism and electricity have some common characteristics that allows us to draw some analogies. Here I am representing a magnetic bar. The N stands for the North Pole and the S for the South Pole. If we were to put iron ore close to the magnetic bar, lines called magnetic lines will appear going from one end to the other end of the bar. In this frame, I am introducing two charges in relative proximity to each other. In the right situation, such as being part of a circuit in having conductive a conductive medium between them they will also create lines the lines they create are called current lines these lines go from one charge to the other they are invisible i have represented them here as green lines in order for us to analyze them Otherwise, as invisible, we could not have seen them. In this frame, I have superimposed the electrical lines and the magnetic lines, so you can see the similitude between them. So, magnetic lines and current lines are the same thing, true or false? The answer is false. Next question. Isopotential lines are perpendicular to current lines. A true, B false. Now I like to go back to the magnetic bar, but this time instead of spreading iron ore on them as we did last time, I have placed them, I have placed the magnetic bars on a surface of compasses. 
as you can see, there is a certain order to the direction of the arrow head in each compass. Here I have put a green square around one compass, around another, and another compass. The three compasses I have selected are in the same column. Notice that the arrowhead in all three compasses separates about the same distance from the North Pole, despite the fact that they are at different distances from the bar. In this frame, I have enlarged the middle compass to show you what I meant. Notice the N and the tip of the arrow. And also notice the distance between them. Notice that the distance is about the same in all three compasses in the column. This imply, as I just mentioned, that the force moving the needle in these three compasses is about the same, despite their different distance from the bar. Now, let's go back to electricity. In this frame, I am representing again two opposite charges in relative proximity to each other, which as you know, in the right situation, such as being part of a circuit in having a conductive medium between them will produce current lines between the charges. Now I will try to measure the electrical force, but instead of using compasses to measure magnetic force as I did with the magnet bar, I will use a voltmeter. So if I measure between the two points represented in this frame, which are one directly below the other. We will get, let's say, three microvolt difference between the two electrodes in their different positions. If we change one of the electrodes to a new position, as shown in this frame, and again measure, we may get lucky in register no voltage between the two new locations. I have represented this in this frame by putting the voltmeter zero microvolts. Obviously this indicates that both electrodes are at the same voltage level. This will be going back to the magnetic analogy as having the same distance between the needle tip and the north. In this frame, I have added the two yellow dots on the current lines corresponding to the location of the electrodes where no faults were found. I am doing this to keep tabs on those locations. You will see the reason in a few seconds. Now I have moved one electrode to a different current line and I will get, let's say, two microvolts representing the difference in voltage between the two sides. At this point, keeping the needle in the new current line, I will move it along until I find a place where the voltmeter shows no voltage difference. Again, I will put a yellow dot at the location in the current line where voltage is zero. Now I will move one electrode to a different current line. And again, move the electrode along the line until the voltmeter shows zero voltage. Mark it, as you can see in this frame, and go through the same process at another current line. 
in when the zero voltage is encountered, I will put another dot in that place. In this frame, I have joined the yellow dots producing a segment of a circular element. This circular element goes through the current lines where there is a zero potential difference. That is a line of equal potential among all the points, thus representing what we call an isopotential line. As you can see in this frame, isopotential lines arise perpendicularly to most distant current lines and also perpendicular to the most central current line. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Isopotential lines are closer to each other on the side of the charges face each other than on the opposite side. A true, B false. In this frame, I am representing the segment of the isopotential line that we previously delineated using the voltmeter. I changed the color to blue because it is on the side of the positive charge. In reality, isopotential lines extend in all three dimensions around a charge. Here I am representing them in two dimensions. In this frame, I am representing an entire isopotential line going around the positive charge. In this frame, I am introducing a second isopotential line belonging to the same field and a third one and a fourth one and finally a fifth one. Notice that the isopotential lines are closer when they are towards the opposite pole. Then when they are expanded in the opposite direction. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Isopotential lines represent power gradient boundaries with an electrical field, within an electrical field. They indicate that the magnitude of a force increases at the distance near the charge and decreases with increasing distance from the charge. A true, B false. In this frame, I have introduced a single positive charge. Now I have introduced its isopotential lines. Isopotential lines, as you know, represent the voltage boundary of the different levels of electrical force generated by the charge. Where we, to use a voltmeter between two isopotential lines close to each other, as in this frame, we can arbitrarily say that the voltmeter will register 10 microvolts. We will get the same voltage, that is 10 microvolts, if we keep the electrode at the same voltage line despite being, as it is in this frame, far from each other. Hence, what is important is not the distance between the electrodes, but the distance the electrodes are from the charge. Now, I have moved the electrodes to different current lines. These current lines are further from the charge, but despite the fact that they are further from the charge, as long as they are kept between the two neighboring isopotential lines, the value will be the same. Please notice that the distance 
between these two electrodes is much larger than the distance between the first example I used. This indicates that there is a lesser charge density at the site that we are just measuring compared to the site that we had measured before. I have represented this in this frame by making a circle with darker color that is darker bluish color in the center and fading it as it goes from the center. Think of the blue as the charges and the white as the liquid in which it is di diluted. So isopotential lines are arranged in such a way as to indicate a big magnitude of force or potential at the points near the charge and a decrease in force with increasing distance from the charge. And as such, they reflect a potential gradient, that is the potential gradient of a field. Isopotential lines are also encountered in negative fields and they have the same meaning. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Current and isopotential lines adapt to the volume of the conductor they are in. A true, B false. In this diagram, I have represented the isopotential lines and the current lines of the same force in a conductor with no resistance but a finite volume. The volume is represented by the magenta rectangle. In this frame, I have shrunk the volume conductor. As a consequence, in this new frame, I have represented the isopotential lines and current lines adjusting to the new size of the volume conductor. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Dipole. A pair of interrelated electric charges of equal magnitude but of opposite polarity separated by a small distance. A true, B false. Electrical fields in biological systems are created by current generators. Current generators can be depicted as dipoles or quadrupoles. Dipoles can be defined as a pair of interrelated electrical charges of equal magnitude but of opposite polarity separated by a small distance. The usual analogy for dipole is a battery. So the answer to this question is A. True. Next question. The isopotential lines around the negative and positive charges of a dipole are equidistant. A. True. B. False. This frame represents two poles of the same dipole. As you can see, the distance between the isopotential lines close to the charge is much shorter than the distance between the isopotential lines further from the charge. Yet, as you recall, the amount of charge contained within each lines, that is, between both lines, is the same. Therefore, using the same example we used before, in the space between the magenta lines close and far from the charge, there will be 10 microvolts. Also notice, as I have pointed out before, that the isopotential lines on the side of the charges that face each other, as indicated here, are closer together. 
than those going away from the charges. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The models used to understand the behavior of dipoles include the battery analogy and the isopotential lines. A true, B false. The behavior of dipoles can be approximated by using the model of isopotential lines, coring line, and by using the battery analogy model. Dipole, as we have seen, can be represented by isopotential lines. The representation of a dipole as an isopotential line is very useful to understand the behavior of dipoles in neurophysiology, especially in relation to current generators arising from the cerebral cortex, and also to understand the behavior of generators originated in the great matter nuclei. Dipole can also be represented as current lines. As we have seen, current lines develop between a positive and a negative charge. In this frame, I am representing a positive and a negative charge flanking a conductor. The conductor, that is the volume conductor, is represented by a rectangle. I am using a re the rectangle to represent a wire. In this frame, I am adding green arrows to represent current lines. Current lines develop because of the difference in voltage between the two sides. In this frame, I have changed the shape of the conductor, converting it from a wire to a plate, wider at the center. And in this new frame, I have adjusted the electrical lines to occupy the whole area. So current lines can be used to depict dipole behavior, but I find current lines modules or model not to be of great help to understand the behavior of dipoles in neurophysiology. On the other hand, I find the battery analogy very good to explain many aspects of the behavior of dipoles. As we know, a dipole can be represented as a pair of interrelated electrical charges as long as we keep in mind that the charges must be of equal magnitude, opposite polarity, and they are and they have to be separated by a small distance. This can be viewed as a battery, as I have pointed in this frame. And we can even use even a simpler analogy related to the battery, which consists of joining a red and a blue square forming a bicolor rectangle to represent, to represent the dipole. We can also do the same, but instead of doing it with uh, squares, to do it with circles. Okay. In this case, you can see a red and a blue circle abutting with each other, representing the negative and the positive charge on different sides. sides. So the answer to this question is true. Next question, quadrupole, that is four electrical charges consisting of two dipoles arranged close together with alternating polarity and operating as a unit. A true, B false. As we just mentioned, electrical field in biological systems are created by current generators. Current generators can be visualized as dipoles or quadrupoles. Quadrupoles consist of two dipoles arranged close together with alternating polarity and operating as a unit. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The behavior of dipoles and quadrupoles 
can be analyzed using the solid angle theorem to explain volume conduction. A true, B false. The solid angle theorem is an intuitive approach to visualizing the behavior of dipoles and quadrupoles in volume conductors. Here I am representing a dipole using a simplification of the battery analogy. Red being the negative pole and blue the positive pole. The angle represented by the yellow line in the circle, as you can see on your left, expands to include the segment of the circle that subtends the area of the negative region of the dipole. I have done the same in the middle figure, but this time I have used the same size yellow segment. I have not adapted to the new to the size of the new figure. Notice that the yellow segment expands beyond the subtended area of the type of the dipole. This indicates that the angle of the dipole subtended by the electrode in the middle figurine is smaller. Now look at the figurine to your right. The same procedure was followed. Notice that the angle is even smaller. Therefore, realize that all this has happened without changing the actual size of the surface exposed to the electrode. I have now represented wave below each dipole. As you can see, the size of the angle corresponds with the size of the wave. So the area of the dipole subtended by the electrode dictates the size of the wave. This can be expressed in the following statement. The solid angle subtended by an object equals the area of the surface divided by the square distance from a specific point where it is measured to the surface of the dipole. In clinical neurophysiology, that is in the textbook of clinical neurophysiology by Jasper, uh, they emphasize the following. They emphasize that there is a difference between monopoles, dipoles, and quadrupoles, and that the mathematical relation with the angle changing changes accordingly. I do not know what to make of it, but I included it here so you can see it. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The models to understand the behavior of quadrupoles include A, isopotential lines, B, cordon lines, C, battery analogy model, D, all of the above. Quadrupoles can also be represented by isopotential lines, cordon lines, and battery analogy model. I will start explaining isopotential lines in relation to quadrupoles. Isopotential lines can represent quadrupole as depicted in this frame. In this new frame, the caramel rectangle that I have just introduced represents the nervous system structure generating the quadrupole. The gray circle now introduced represents an electrode capturing the isopotential lines. The disk is above the generator, right on top of the sink. The sink is the negative field created by the positive charges leaving the extracellular space and moving into the intracellular space, therefore leaving a negativity behind. The eye I just introduced indicates the point of reference from where the field is being looked at. In this case, it is being looked at from right above it. 
the isopotential line model may be used to explain quadruple function in certain situations, but it is not as helpful as the other two. Quadruples can also be represented as current lines. I find the current lines model very helpful to understand the behavior of quadruples in neurophysiology. This frame depicts a quadruple generator in the form of a caramel rectangle that could represent a dendritic or an axon segment. On top of it, you can see a representation of the current lines produced by the quadrupole. The current lines are drawn as they would be captured by an electrode placed above the segment of the generator producing the quadrupole. The blue lines at both sides or at both ends indicate positive charges moving in the direction of the electrode. The red lines indicate positive charges going away from the electrode. The angle of vision of the current line is from the side. As I just mentioned, I find current lines very helpful to understand the contribution of quadrupole to, neuro, to, neuro, to neurophysiological testing. The last model to explain quadrupole is the battery analogy. The battery analogy is also very helpful because it helps to understand the creation and the movement of quadrupoles. I will take a few minutes to explain it. Let's start by considering a segment of an axon at rest, with the layers outside the membrane being positive and just inside being negative, as you can see in this frame. Now I am introducing a cathode and activating it. This will produce a shift in the membrane polarity under the cathode. This will be so because the cathode will induce positive charges to go from the extracellular space into the axon just below it. In this frame, I have removed the cathode to better visualize the membrane and the distribution of potentials. At this junction, we must bring the solid angle theorem into play in order to understand the battery analogy model. This theorem states that the electrical activity captured from a point of view of an electrode is only recorded when the charges view by the electrode have the same polarity facing the electrode. So let's say that the cache area of the electrode is as shown here. This smaller green triangle will see the, pos the positive side of the dipole at the membrane closer to the electrode. I have half hi highlighted this area by encircling it. You can s in a magenta circle. And the positive pole of the dipole on the further side from the electrode, which I have also encircled in the magenta lines. Thus, they will be registered. The electrodes will also register those dipoles with the same polarity from the seg segment of the, act of the axon subtended by the red triangle that I have just added to the frame. In this case, the electrode will also see the, ne the negative pole of the two dipoles closer to the electrode and the negative pole of the two dipoles in the membrane further from the electrode. 
So again, they will be registered. The rest of the dipoles under the blue triangle, the positive pole of the dipole closer, the electrical, the electrode will be matched by the negative pole of the dipole further from the electrode inside the cell. Hence, they will not register and as such have no impact on the magnitude of the force registered by the electrode. Thus, area where the electrodes saw the negative and the positive poles, which I have removed from this frame, will not be captured, and the electrode will only perceive the dipoles subtended by the green and the red triangle. Since, as you can see, the same poles are being viewed by the electrode. Such perception will create two columns of charges. In one column, the positive pole will be on one direction on the other column, the positive pole will be on the opposite direction. The reason that they do not cancel each other is that they are not part of the same triangle and because if we were to cancel them, the analogy would not work. In any case, such occurrence can be depicted as two set of batteries shown as shown in this picture which can be further reduced to two negative fields facing each other, here represented in red, flanked by two positive fields looking away from each other, here represented in blue. So the answer to this question is D, all of the above. Next question. Quadrupoles at the site of their generation and as they travel along an axon have a symmetrical configuration. A true, B false. I have used this figure in the past. It represents a quadrupole being captured by an electrode right on top of the sink while being viewed from the side. As you can see, the current lines are symmetrical representing two equal magnitude dipoles. Such a quadrupole will be created at the site of an excitatory postsynaptic potential. I am representing the excitatory postsynaptic potential by the green arrow. Symmetrical quadrupoles occur in the peripheral nervous system exactly under the cathode or at the neuromuscular junction. This is so because the advancing quadrupoles have some asymmetry between the leading and the trailing dipole and because in the central nervous system the apical dendrite tends to have the receptor more distally than proximally. Therefore, since they are not in the middle, the expansion of the of one quadrupole tend to be always bigger than of the other quadrupole, but it is important to remember that this is only minor, this is a minor difference that doesn't really make that much of an impact in the overall um, evaluation of the central nervous system or the peripheral ne nervous system. Once the quadrupole begins to move a certain degree of asymmetry between the leading and the trailing dipole will occur, will occur as we just mentioned, and I am trying to represent this frame. I hope you notice the difference in size. It's important for us to understand that the asymmetry is relatively minimal as long as the quadrupole is advancing through a relative homogeneous medium and in a steady direction. As you can see, 
by the direction of the arrow, this quadrupole is traveling to the left. Hence, the leading dipole has more current lines and they are more compact than in the trailing dipole. The explanation given by some authors regarding this asymmetry can be summarized by saying that whereas the leading dipole is encountering fresh axonal area, the trailing dipole is, is being produced by an already used axonal area. It is also important for me to mention and for you to keep in mind that the degree of asymmetry will vary depending on many different factors and so will the fields and the wave that the traveling quadrupole will produce. For example, when quadrupoles go from one medium to another medium with different characteristics, here represented by the transition from black to purple, the asymmetry will become more significant. That is the asymmetry of the quadrupole. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The models used to understand the behavior of dipoles and quadrupoles are imperfect methods to approximate the behavior of current generators and fields in biological tissue. A true, B false. In the same fashion that gravity explains the behavior of certain elements in physics but not others, and relativity explains some phenomenon but not others, the models we have just represented are tools that allow us to understand and make rational decisions regarding their physiological findings. They certainly do not explain all, nor do any of them fit every circumstance encountered during neurophysiology. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The most important body boundary surface during EEG recording is between the CSF space and the bone. A true, B false. In this frame, I have listed some factors that influence field characteristics. In clinical neurophysiology, the factors that affect an electrical field are the magnitude of the field, the dielectric constant of the tissue, the size and shape of the volume conductor, and the boundaries between the different tissues. In this frame, I have superimposed the field corresponding to a dipole onto the brain. I have represented brain tissue as gray, the CSF in light blue, the skull in white, and the skin in pink. I have done this to show you in the next frame the constraint effect of the medium. As you can see, there is an alteration of the field at the CSF bone boundary and in the CSF scalp boundary, but the biggest alteration occurs at the scalp air interface. At the scalp air interface, there is no expansion of the field beyond the skin because air is a very poor conductor. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. An electrical field created by a dipole near the skin air boundary will be less distorted than an electrical field created by a dipole further from this boundary. A true, B false. This dipole and its field are at a certain distance from the scalp and as such will produce a reflection consistent with the isopotential lines at the skin surface air interface. This reflection consists of only one isopotential line which reflects that all the zone is at the same voltage level. Hence it can be said that it has a low voltage gradient. Now I have represented a dipole with the same characteristics except that it is closer to the surface. 
as you can see, there is a significant alteration of the feel and at the level of the skin air interface, there are multiple isopotential lines reflecting multiple voltage zone, zones, thus having a higher voltage gradient than the prior example. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. A dipole can be used to explain the electrical behavior of pyramidal cells. A true, B false. This is a representation of a pyramidal cerebral cortical cell. But with some variation, it could be a pyramidal-like cell anywhere else in the central nervous system. The pyramidal cortical cell is the generator of electrical activity recorded during EEG. The important pyramidal cerebral cortical cell structures for our current discussion are the apical dendrite with its distal portion and proximal portion, the cell body And in addition to these uh, important areas, we got to know a little bit of neurophysiology. And, that, and the most important thing is that at the state of rest, a thin layer of extracellular space in the vicinity of the neuron is positive, as you can see in this frame. If the distal portion of the dendrite is subject to a large enough excitatory stimulus, Positive charges will move into the cell, ending up in the intracellular side of the dendrite. An electrode localized in the extracellular space close to the segment of the membrane that shifts polarity will see a current made of positive charges moving away from it towards the inside of the dendrite. Therefore, they will see a sink and it will be recorded as a negativity. This negativity will be flanked by two sources expressed as current produced by positive charges moving towards the electrode flanking the sink. In this frame, I have tried to represent the phenomenon as involving both sides, that is, the distal and the proximal side. And in this new frame, as involving three sides to give it a more three dimensional look to it. This model would consider current line as a feasible model to explain dendritic stimulation. At this junction, I'd like to show you a paragraph from a classic textbook. Take a few seconds to read it. You can stop the video. The bottom line is that the behavior of pyramidal cells regarding dendritic postsynaptic potentials can be explained without the complication that would arise from using quadrupole model and the current model line to explain its behavior. So for practical purpose, when considering the model to explain EG finding, it is better not to think in terms of quadrupoles, but to think in terms of dipole. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. A dipole isopotential line model can be used to explain the electrical behavior of pyramidal cells. We already mentioned that the quadrupole model is unnecessarily complex to explain the electrical behavior of pyramidal cells. This is so regardless of the specific quadrupole model we use, current lines, isopotential lines, or battery an analogy. Pyramidal cells can be represented in a simpler fashion by using the dipole models we have spoken about late, uh, before. Pyramidal cells can be represented in a simpler fashion by using 
the dipole models we have spoken about late, uh, before. As you can see in this frame, pyramidal The other method that has been used to understand the behavior of pyramidal cells, that is of cortical pyramidal cells, is the battery analogy model. This method is coupled with the solid angle theorem in many instances in order to explain the behavior a little bit more thoroughly. In this frame, I have represented a pyramidal cell at rest. At rest, the inside is more negative than the outside, as I have represented in this frame by the position of the little batteries. In the event of an excitatory postsynaptic potential, there will be a shift in the membrane potential in the segment of the dendrite involved by the excitatory postsynaptic potential, that is, in the apical segment of the dendrite. The apical segment of the dendrite will become negative as the positive ions go inside the cell. This is depicted in this frame by the positive side of the battery being inside the distal dendritic region. This leads to a line of demarcation where a prevalence of negative charges will occur in the extracellular space in the apical dendritic region and a prevalence of positive charges in the extracellular space will occur around the proximal region of the dendrite. The area of demarcation, that is the interface between the different regions, will be perceived by an electrode according to the solid angle theorem. Only in that area where the negative charges align on both sides towards the electrode they, they will register. I have represented this in this frame by the changing of color of the negative signs in the two batteries that align with the angle of the electrode. This angle being represented by the omega symbol. In this new frame I have simplified the vision from the electrode by just representing two batteries with the negative side facing the electrode and the positive pole in the opposite direction. This can be further simplified as a sphere representing the area of the axon with a negative side represented by the red circle and a positive side represented by a blue circle. Of the blue circle, we can only see the rim since it is under the red circle. It is also possible to simplify this model even further as a negative pole and a positive pole. Such a representation is very useful to understand the behavior of a palisite, a palisite of pyramidal cells in vitro, as well as in vivo, and the behavior of pyramidal cells in the neocortex. 
you can see a representation of a convolution in the positions of the negative and positive signs. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Isopotential lines are the origin of isopotential maps. A true, B false. In this frame, I am representing an ensemble of many pyramidal neurons and their corresponding isopotential lines. And now I am representing the same thing in miniature, using the simple negative positive signs at both ends of the pyramidal cell. As you can see, this represents a flat typo layer. This layer of neurons create current lines, which have negative and positive isopotential lines. Now I label a line S to represent the boundary zone between the body surface and the air, in this case the scalp, and add arbitrary numbers in microvolts to each negative isopotential line at the scalp crossing. Now I have used these values to create an isopotential map. So from the isopotential lines you can create an isopotential map. And the same isopotential lines can also be used to plot a potential distribution of the field. As you can see, creating that potential distribution will cre create a bell-shaped curve along the scalp. You can see the bell-shaped curve under the, isopoten the negative isopotential fields. So the answer to this question is True. Next question. Isopotential maps can also be drawn from isopotential lines generated at the spinal cord. A true, B false. This frame represents a hemicord. In it, I am introducing a pyramidal shaped cell. Now I have introduced the isopotential lines corresponding to an excitatory potential generated at the apical dendrite and the corresponding fields produced at the imaginary body surface air interface. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The solid angle theorem can be used to explain the isopotential map that would result from dipole at the crown of a gyrus. A true, B false. The figure in this frame depicts a layer of dipoles at the crown of a gyrus with a portion of the skull on top of it and the thin white line representing the scalp. The letter P and the number that it stands by the letter is there to represent different electrode positions. The area of the cortex subtended by angles of each electrode is depicted in this frame. In this frame, I have added the letter omega and a number corresponding to each electrode, and also I have added the negative, the negative sign to each omega because all the electrodes are subtending the negative pole of the dipole. 
I have now added a potential line to indicate the magnitude of the field. The potential line is on your left indicated by the double headed arrow with a minus and a plus sign and the microvolt by the side. If we were to plot the activity as seen by the electrodes P1 to P5, we would get a bell-shaped curve. Characteristic of a vertical dipole. This term is used to imply that the field resembles a field generated by a single dipole oriented with its axis at the right angle to the scalp. This frame introduces the correspondent isopotential map. And the potential just introduced correspond to the wave of the isopotential maps where each electrode paired with the distant electrode at a neutral point. That is uh, the potentials on your right. As you can see, the tallest wave will correspond to electrode P3, the one with the widest subtended cortical area. So the answer to this question is A, true. Next question. To a generator occupying the crown of a gyrus and the immediate walls of the sol side flanking the crown and a generator restricted to the crown of a gyrus produce the same potential profile? Yes, A is yes, B is no. This figure represents a generator occupying the crown of a gyrus and the immediate walls of the sol side flanking it. At this point, I have not revealed to you the potential profile of a generator in this situation, hence I will use the symbol X for unknown. This figure I have just added represents a generator occupying the crown of a gyrus only. You know from the answer to the previous question that a generator occupying only the crown will have a bell-shaped potential profile. So the question is if a generator distributed at the crown of, of a gyrus and the immediate walls of the sol side flanking it and a generator in the crown produces the same potential profile? The answer is yes, they do. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The potential profile of an area of the cerebral great mantle can be determined using the formula below. A yes, B no. I have simplified the formula in this frame to make, to make it easy to explain it. The magnitude of the effective angle, that is the angle that is registered by an electrode which is not always the same as the angle seen by the electrode is calculated by subtracting the, de the degree of the angle with the least value of one polarity from the degree of the angle with the highest value of the opposite polarity. In this frame I have gone back to the use of the original formula and under it I have explained the terms that, that they are using. So the answer to this question is A. Yes. Next question. The 
magnitude of the effective angle of an electrode, one, represented by omega a, is smaller than the magnitude of the effective angle registered from electrode 2, represented by omega b. a true, b false. I hope these questions become clearer when with the following illustration. In this frame, I have depicted a generator distributed at the crown of a gyrus and the immediate walls of the solsi flanking it. The generator consists of a mantle of dipoles with the negative poles close to the surface. In this frame, I have added the elements needed to build a potential profile. You have seen this in the past. Nevertheless, I will go through it one more time. So the y-axis corresponds to amplitude and the x-axis corresponds to the location of the electrode in relation to the scalp. The scalp in this frame is represented by the thin curvy pink line. The letter P will be used in the next frame to indicate the position of the electrodes. In this frame, I am placing the first electrode right on top of the crown and label it P3. The green angle with the vertex at P3 represents the angle of view of the P3 electrode. It is important to remember that what an electrode sees and what an, an electrode re registers are two different things that may or may not be at the end uh, of the same value. So they may or may not have the same value. In this case, the base of the angle that falls upon the surface of the cortex corresponds to the area of the cortex obtained by the P3 electrode. That is, the area seen by the electrode will be the same as the area registered by the electrode. Why? Because from the position of P3, only one surface is seen. In this new frame, I have removed the dipoles not seen by P3 electrode and kept only those that are seen by P3 electrode. Remember what I said before, that one thing is to see and another one is to perceive. So the electrode can see one thing and perceive another one, or it can see one thing and perceive the same thing. In this case, it perceives the same thing because it's only looking at one mantle. Well, as you can see in this frame, I have removed the dipoles on the lateral wall of the gyrus. I have done so because as far as P3 electrode is concerned, they do not contribute to its effective angle because both poles of those dipoles were seen as equal and opposite, and therefore they would have they were cancelled out. So now at the chart for the potential profile, I will place a point corresponding with the number of charges viewed by P3. In this case, five negative charges. As you can see in this frame, I have reintroduced all the dipoles on the walls of the gyros which I had previously removed. I have done so to be able to represent their potential as seen by the electrode I just labeled P5. From this position, the P5 electrode see some of the negative poles of the dipoles at the crown of the gyrus and on the proximal wall of the gyrus, but it also sees some of the positive poles of the dipoles on the distal wall. In this new frame, I have removed all the dipoles not being seen by P5. Now I will leave only 
the poles of those dipoles that are seen. So what the P5 electrode registers is one negative pole because from the six negative poles you have to subtract the five positive poles that are seen on the distal rim of the gyrus. That is, you have to subtract from the six negative poles that, you, that is they are seen in the proximal edge of the gyrus, the five that are seen on the opposite side. In this frame, I have added the aqua point at the potential profile, where we to do the same on the other side, we would get the same but opposite, as you can see in this frame. Thus, producing a bell-shaped curve. So the answer to this question is the answer to this question is B, false. Next question: The solid angle theorem cannot be used to draw an isopotential map of a field created by a cerebral cortex horizontal dipole layer. A true, B false. By the same token, the solid angle theorem can also explain the wave produced by a field generated at the rim of a convolution or a gyrus. A dipole at the wall of a gyrus is considered a horizontal dipole because its axis is parallel to the scalp. At least ideally, when the activated dipole is restricted to this area, the same principle applies as we have used before to develop an isopotential map. In this case, the representation will conclude a negative and a positive field as depicted in this graph, since on one side it will look negative to the electrode 1 and 2, in the electrode 3 it will not register at all and in the electrode 4 and 5 it will look positive. I have tried to represent it, I have tried to represent this above in the potential chart. Were we to translate this to an actual EEG wave using a neutral reference, we would detect a single phase reversal as it is portrayed on the right side of your screen. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. A positive field traveling away from an electrode connected to the G1 leg of a differential amplifier will advance a wave in the negative direction. A true, B false. This frame shows a field represented as current lines model traveling in the direction of an electrode. The electrode is entering the differential amplifier through the G1 leg of the amplifier. The electrode connected to G2 is, are, is coming from a neutral place. The result of this arrangement is a tracing going in a negative direction when the field is approaching the probing electrode. Now the electrode is on top of the leading dipole. This will result in a negative change in direction with the tracing moving in the negative direction. As the sink of the trading dipole comes into view, the wave turns positive since the charges in the trailing dipole are less dense than those in the leading dipole. But there could be another explanation for this 
and the explanation would be that the wave turning more negative occurs because the sink is now moving away from the probing electrode. At the level of the zero isopotential line, the wave will reach the baseline. When the source of the trading dipole is captured, the initial consequence will be for the wave to become still even more positive. But as the positivity moves away from the electrode, as it is represented in this frame, the wave will turn negative. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. A positive field traveling away from an electrode connected to the G2 leg of a differential amplifier will advance a wave in the negative direction. This is basically a representation of what I just mentioned in the question, which is that the G, the electrode looking at the electrical field is coming in through the G2 leg of the differential amplifier, whereas the G1 will be in this X instant going towards the neutral area. The consequence of this will be an inversion of the wave that we previously described. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The battery solid angle theorem can be used to explain traveling electrical fields in neurophysiology. A true, B false. As you recall, when we answer one of the previous questions, the battery model in conjunction with the solid angle theorem results in a specific way of looking at an action potential advancing in an unmillionated axon. This frame simplifies the battery model even further by representing the positive pole as a blue rectangle and the negative pole as a red rectangle. So let's now imagine that an, an unmillionated axon is being surveyed by an electrode relatively close to the axon here indicated and a reference electrode not represented in this frame at a very distant and neutral location. In this frame, I have introduced a line to indicate the baseline of the wave that is about to be recorded. For the sake of clarity, I will change the electrode to just a blue dot. Now I will bring the battery model and further simplify it as I just previously mentioned by the rectangle rectangles that is the blue rectangles for the positive and the red rectangle for the negative in the form of dipoles so they are close together two factors dictate the impact of the field that the field will have on the wave it creates the distance from the electrode and the angle formed by the batteries in this frame i have added two lines in yellow forming an angle enclosing the distal dipole. Now I have added a second pair of lines to encode the proximal dipole. I will use these lines to track the movement of the quadrupole in the unmillionated axon. I will label the angle of the proximal dipole A and the angle of the distal dipole B. This arrangement will 
initially produce a positive deviation of the wave because the positivity of the angle A is closer than the negativity of angle B and the subtended area of both dipole view from the electrode represented by the blue spot is about the same. The tracing will a little later turn in negative in a negative direction because although the positivity in angle A is closer, the surface of the angle is smaller. That is the surface of the angle of A is smaller than the surface of the angle of B. In other words, the proximity of angle A to the electrode is contrasted by the large surface of the, neg the negativity of angle B. The tracing at this junction will continue to move in the negative direction because although the positivity in angle A is closer to the electrode as it was last time, the surface subtended by the angle A is smaller than the surface of angle B. In other words, the larger surface of angle B, despite being further than the surface of angle A, contributes more to the power of the weight being recorded. This is more or less exactly what happened in the previous frame. The tracing at this junction will continue to move in the negative direction again because now the only surface captured is the negative surface of angle B. No surface is subtended by angle A since the angle includes both positive and negative poles of the dipole. The tracing will now progress in any direction, so will not progress in any direction at this point because both angles are at the same size and the negative angle of B by virtue of its moving towards the electrode will be negative while the negative angle of a by virtue of it being moved by by virtue of it moving away from the electrode is viewed by the electrode as positive. The tracing at this junction, as you can see in this frame, will turn in the positive direction because now the surface of the angle B does not contribute to the wave while the negative surface of angle A is moving away from the electrode. Notice that a negative surface traveling in the direction of the electrode will produce a negative devi deviation, whereas a negative surface traveling away from the electrode will produce a positive deviation. The tracing will continue to move in the positive direction because the subtended area of the negative surface in angle A traveling away from the electrode creates a positive field that is not compensated because of the angle of angle B whose positive, positive surface has now become a negative force but has much smaller subtended area than angle A. As in the previous frame the tracing will continue to move in the positive direction for the same reasons. And at this junction, the tracing will neither continue in a positive or in a negative direction because the negative force created by the proximity of the positive phase of angle B going away from the electrode is compensated by the positive force created by the larger subtended negative surface of angle A. At this junction the tracing will move towards negativity because the negative force created by the closer subtended surface of angle A as it moves away from the electrode is stronger than the positive force of angle B as its negative surface moves away from the electrode. This is because the surface of angle B is further 
than the surface of angle A. Finally, the quadrupole is no longer present and the wave returns to baseline. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. A traveling electrical field can only produce triphasic waves. A true, B false. This frame represents an axon in yellow. The blue arrow represents the trajectory of an action potential and the nerve conduction equipment with one electrode close to the axon, the probing electrode, and another very far away from the axon at the neutral point. And now I have added the area of the conducting surface around the axon, that is the, vol the area of the volume conductor. In this case, the volume of distribution, as you can see, is very thin. And as you can see, it has produced a monopolar wave. In this new frame, the volume of distribution is larger, and now the wave created is a biphasic wave. In this new frame, the volume of distribution is even larger, and the wave generated it's been represented by a, tri a triphasic wave. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The size of the volume conductor influenced the shape of the electrical field. A true, B false. As you can see in this frame, the current lines corresponding to a field are inside the gray rectangle. The gray rectangle represents the different size of the volume conductors. As it is represented here, the electrical field has to adjust to the volume of the conductor. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. In clinical neurophysiology, a triphasic wave is more likely produced by a field distributed in a dash volume conductor. And the options are A, very restricted, B, somewhat restricted, C, large, D, all of the above. This wave is a monophasic wave. A monophasic wave occurs when an electrical field is confined to a very restricted volume conductor and the reference electrode is at a distant neutral site. This is so because the first thing it is noticed by the probing electrode of the approaching field is the sink, which is, as you know, negative because it is the segment of the axon through which the positive ions are leaving the extracellular space and moving into the intracellular space. The tracing will continue to move in the negative direction because up to this point the bulk of the sink is moving towards the electrode. As soon as the electrode perceives that the bulk of the sink is moving away from the electrode, the direction of the tracing will switch in a positive direction, as shown in this frame. The positive direction will continue until a baseline is achieved. Now, in this new frame, I am introducing a biphasic wave. As you see, it has a positive initial de uh, deviation and then it has a big negative deviation. A biphasic wave will occur using the same electrodes 
as we did for the prior example. That is one probing electrode on top of the volume conductor and the reference electrode far away in a neutral point. When the first aspect of the field is viewed by the electrode, it will be a, pos a positive electrical field, as you can see in this frame. The wave will reverse its polarity in a negative direction once the electrode sees the approaching negativity. As soon as the electrode sees the bulk of the negativity moving away from the electrode, the wave perceived will take a positive direction. In this case, the going away positivity does not create a negative deflection because the field going away is at a poor angle for the electrode and the distance is too far to be captured. And finally, this is, a, a, as you know, a triphasic wave. A triphasic wave will occur when the volume of the conductor is big enough to allow the electrical field to expand as it is shown in this frame. Thus, as the positivity of the field approaches, the electrode will register at with the approaching negativity the wave will turn negative the wave will continue going in the negative direction up to until the bulk of the negativity has passed under the probing electrode and the electrode starts perceiving the negativity moving away The negative trend will continue, but when the electrode starts to perceive the going away positivity thanks to the angle afforded by the bigger separation between the generator and the electrode, a negative de deviation of the wave will occur, and therefore a triphasic wave will appear. So the answer to this question is C, large. Next question. A diphasic wave may occur with very restricted volume conductor if probing and reference electrodes are both on the path of the current generator. A true, B false. We already described how a very restricted volume conductor may yield a monophasic wave. The same axon in the same volume conductor can produce a biphasic wave, as you will see in the next few frames. As the field approaches the first electrode, the first perception of the field that that electrode will have is the negative component of the field moving towards it. As the field reaches the electrode and travels under and then it starts moving away from it, a wave recorder will reach maximum negativity and then turn positive. When the field reaches the second electrode going into the machine that is entering the differential amplifier through the reference spot. The polarity will invert by nature of the differential amplifier. Thus, it will yield a positive deviation of the wave as the negative component of the field travels towards the electrode and a negative bend when the negative field is traveling away from the electrode. So the answer to this question is A, true. Next question, a complex, complex wave may occur with very restricted volume conductor 
if probing and reference electrodes are both on the path of the current generator. A true, B false. We already discussed how a generator in a large volume conductor can produce a triphasic wave. Now, I would like to show you what happens if the same field in the same volume conductor is viewed by two electrodes on the path of the current generator. As the field travels towards the first electrode, the positive field traveling towards the electrode produces a downward deviation. When the first electrode faces the negative aspect of the field traveling towards it, the wave will deviate upwards. Then, as the positive aspect of the field starts traveling away from the electrode, the wave will register a negative deflection, which will continue in the negative trend as a result of the positive aspect of the field traveling towards the second electrode. Remember, this electrode is entering through the second portal of the differential amplifier thus the polarity of the wave is inverted in relation to the first electrode. So, at the peak of the negative aspect of the field being recorded by the second electrode, the wave will go in the downwards direction, that is in the positive direction. As the negative wa wave starts moving, or that is, as, as the negative field starts moving away, the wave will demonstrate a negative turn. And as the positive area goes away, the wave will take a downward turn. So the answer to this question is true. Next question, which of the following structures only behave like an open field? A, oculomotor nucleus, B, superior olive, C, accessory olive, D, hippocampus. Activation of the oculomotor nucleus produces a closed field. Activation of the superior olive also produces a closed field. Activation of the accessory olive produces an open field. The activation of the hippocampus produces a field that can be considered open or closed. Uh, I find this dual interpretation of the hippocampus difficult to, to understand, yet it seems physiologic that it, it makes it makes sense from the point of view that many physiologists uh, seem to think that that is the case. So the answer to this question is C, accessory olive. Next question, which of the following structure cannot produce a traveling field? A, a nerve, B, spinal cord tract, three, C. Cerebellum. D. Anterior horn of the spinal cord. This figure corresponds to the right side of the spinal cord. In it, I am superimposing the dorsal root fibers traveling in the spinal nerve. The spinal nerve are generators of traveling electrical fields. Now I am po pointing to the dorsal ganglia. The field created at the dorsal ganglia is a stationary field. The proximal axon of the dorsal 
ganglion neurons pointed by the arrow produce a traveling field. Electri electrical activity in the cuneus tract produces a traveling field. The dorsal nucleus, where some of the dorsal neurons axons make contact, produces an a stationary field. It is interesting that the ascending posterior column produces a traveling field as it goes up in the cord, but at the level of the foramen magnum produces a traveling and a stationary field. Median nerve finger stimulation produces a traveling and an stationary field as the nerves goes from the hand to the forearm. Once in the distal forearm, it produces only a traveling field. Some authors believe that the anterior to posterior lag seen in some triphasic waves indicate a traveling field in the brain. And therefore, they consider that a traveling field can occur in the brain. So the answer to this question is So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which of the following is a characteristic of white matter near field? A. Fully propagation is inconsistent. B. Medium non homogeneous. C. Will be missed using short inter electrode distances. D. Onset latency will change with body position. As you recall, when we talked about near and far field, we said that the criteria to label a field as near or far was different in white matter than in gray matter. This question deals with white matter fields. The source of these fields is volley propagation. Volley propagation, when it's constant, produces a near field. In inconstant propagation produces a far field. Near fields occurred in homogeneous medium. Far fields occurred in non-homogeneous mediums. Near fields are captured using close closely placed electrodes. Far fields are captured with widespread electrodes only. Near fields are captured with both electrodes on the same side of the dipole. Far fields are only captured when the electrodes are on opposite side of the dipole. Not every physiologist believes this to be true. Onset latency changes with electrode position when capturing when captured by a near field. The onset latency of a far field does not change with electrode position. Body position changes near and far field onset latencies. Peak latencies of Near fields changes with electrode position. Far field peak latency does not change with electrode position. Peak latency of near field change with body part positions, whereas those of far fields do not. The polarity of a near field is consistent. The polarity of a far field is not. So the answer to this question is D. Onset latency will change with body position. Gray matter, far and near fields indicate different mechanisms of generation. A true, B false. 
it is only the electrode position in relation to the electrical field that defines a great field as near or far. When a field is recorded from close to the generator, they are called near fields. When recorded from a distance from the generator, they are called a far field. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. A white far field may be created by a crushed nerve or track, a change in size or direction of a nerve or a track, or changes in the nature or volume of the conducting, conducting medium. A true, B false. White matter far fields arise when a traveling quadrupole becomes significantly asymmetrical. I added the word significant because a slight asymmetry always exists between the leading and the trailing dipole in a moving quadrupole. Significant asymmetry occurs in crushed nerve and when there is a change in the density of the medium through which the nerve is traveling. A significant asymmetry is also found when the medium changes in volume or there is a change in direction of the medium that affects the trajectory of the nerve or track. The term junctional field are often used to refer to the fields produced in this fashion. Another reason for a symmetrical quadrupole is when there is a significant branching of the nerve or track. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Which of the following is true regarding white matter far fields? Onset latency changes with body position. B. Peak latency changes with body position. C. Peak latency changes with electrode position. D. Onset latency changes with electrode position. In this frame, the derivation is indicated by the circles and the spheres, as you can see, pointed by the magenta arrow. And it's also indicated by the magenta arrow in the bottom part of the frame. The spheres correspond to the same, the position that you can see in the little men that are drawn on the right side of your frame. Notice that they correspond to the circle and the spheres in the little men on top and in the little men at the bottom. As you can see, the onset latency and the peak latency is the same despite the different position of the probing electrodes. Represented in yellow in the upper little man and in purple in the lower little man. In this new frame, the position of the electrode has not changed, but the position of the arm being tested has. The characteristic of a far field is that the onset latency changes with the change in position, but the peak latency does not change. This is an important distinction between the two types of fields. On the other hand, 
white matter near fields change onset and peak latencies with the change in electrode position and with changes in limb position. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Far field potential can be recorded as positive and negative diphasic potentials. A true, B false. If you have a special interest on the subject, stop the recording and read this abstract. If you do not, just skip it. The answer to this question is true. Next question. Far field potentials occur with every nerve conduction study. A true, B false. The stimulus artifact is a far field potential because it, it, it is instantly transmitted and is seen at the same time in distal and proximal recording sites. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Each node of Randier at a time can be positive or negative, but not both. A, true, B, false. As you can see, this frame portrays a myelin axon. The myelin is represented by the yellow blobs. The arrow on top indicates the direction of the that the electricity is traveling. As you can see, each node has either a sink or a source in this frame. As it moves, the same thing will happen. The node from here will either be a sink or will be a source. So the answer to this question is true. Now I am going to spend just a few more minutes in the closing remarks. Closing remarks should not include any new information and certainly not contradict what has been said earlier on in, in any talk. But these closing remarks, or for these closing remarks, I will break both commandments. I will start by showing you this frame. It depicts three cerebral convolutions with three active dipoles in different regions of the convolution. The one on the left depicts a generator on the crown of a gyrus. The field is represented above in the form of isopotential lines. At the level of the surface, as you can see, only the negative field is present. In the convolution in the middle, I have represented the generator at the edge of the gyros. As you can see, it produces an oblique dipole that can be captured at the surface. The one on the right, I have represented a generator at the edge of the gyros producing a horizontal dipole. Right on top of the isopotential line, I have placed three isopotential fields, as they could be seen if we were recording from the scalp. Now I have introduced the wave corresponding to those isopotential maps. This neat explanation is based on brain waves being the product of dipoles confined to a very small area of the cerebral mantle, yet we know that this is not the case. In a study by Tao published in 2005, 
where the area of the cortex involved necessary to create a scalp potential was investigated, it was found that they found that this is not so. They compared the findings from an intracranial grid to scalp recordings. They found that the cortical mantle involvement of less than six centimeters square never produces scalp spike. The area at the level of the cortex of less than 10 centimeters square only produces spike in 10% of the cases. And that area larger than 10 centimeters square produce a scalp spike in about 90% of the time. So, the current explanation for the shape of the waves based on the restricted localization of the active mantle layer seems unlikely. 10 centimeters of cortex is likely to include the side, the rim, and the crown of many convolutions. Yet, we still see dipoles on the regular EEG that according to our theory would only be present with involvement of restricted areas of a convolution. As you probably know, I could certainly point out other examples of incongruity in this talk. Yet, overall, I have tried to summarize in this talk concepts that could be used as tools that I hope will help you understand clinical neurophysiology a little bit better. Thank you.